Hello, I'm Nigel Cooper and for the past two weeks I've been in possession of two digital medium format cameras, the Fuji GFX100 and the Hasselblad X1D 250C. Fuji's offering sports a 102 megapixel sensor while the Hasselblad features a 50 megapixel sensor. So during this video I'm going to be doing a review and evaluation of both of them while also showing you some side-by-side -side comparisons of some of the photographs I've taken on both these cameras. So the key difference here is that the Fuji has a sensor with double the amount of pixels compared to the Hasselblad. But there's something else to consider. Although the Fuji has a 102 megapixel sensor compared to Hasselblad's 50, both sensors are CMOS sensors made by Sony and more importantly, they're both the same physical size of 43.8 by 32.9 millimeters. So what does this mean when it comes to comparing Fuji's 102 megapixel camera with Hasselblad's 50 megapixel camera? Well, this is where individual pixel size comes into play. Pixels are so small that their size is measured in microns. Here, the size of the individual pixels in the Hasselblad X1D are 5.3 microns in size, while the Fuji pixels are a little smaller at 3.76 microns. This is due to the fact that there are twice as many pixels on the Fuji sensor, and to fit them all on the same physical space, they have to make them smaller. What does this mean? Well, regarding the physics and science, it's a well-known fact that larger pixels give greater dynamic range in the final images, which is good for us photographers. The flip side to this coin is that the smaller the pixels, the more of them that you can fit on the sensor, which results in more resolution and image detail, but possibly at the expense of dynamic range and tonal quality. So this is where manufacturers have to strike a balance between out and out resolution and dynamic range, tone and colour quality, these latter three being just as important, if not more so, than resolution alone. On paper, the Fuji should resolve more resolution and finer detail in the resulting images, while the Hasselblad should demonstrate more stops of dynamic range, which should result in better tonal transition. So does this bear out in the real world? After using both these cameras side by side for a few weeks on a number of different shoots and scrutinizing the resulting RAW images in Capture One for the Fuji, and Hasselblad's own focus software for the Hasselblad shots, I'd have to say, well, yes, sort of, depending on the subject matter. I don't like to go a whole bunch on scientific testing, I don't like shooting test charts in a clinical environment, instead I like to shoot real world images in the real world and compare those instead. Okay, so we're here in, um, where are we? Suffolk, somewhere. We're in <laughs> Suffolk, <laughs> somewhere, in a forest, and I'm going to take some shots of Daniela here. Um, with the Hasselblad X1D2 and this Fuji GFX100. Um, both cameras are set to f4 and I've got the ISO on both of them set to 800. So let's take a couple of shots on each camera, see how that pans out. Okay, are we ready? <laughs> Okie doke, let me get this to boot up. Here we go. And okay, let's try one more. And chin down a little. A super, hold that. Okay, one tick. <laughs> Beast. <laughs> right, here we go. Uh, see if I can get this IAF to kick in. Right, okay, here we go. Uh, right, that's looking good. Here we are. F4. Just going to step back a bit. Okay. There we go, that's looking good. Okay, and chin down a little. That's great, and one more. Super. So I guess now's a good time to jump onto the computer to show you a few side-by-side -side comparisons of some of the images that I've captured on these two cameras over the past couple of weeks. Okay, so there's three images that I'm going to show you here. Um, on the right hand side, as you can see, we've got the Fuji GFX100 images that are in Capture 120. And on the left hand side, we have the Hasselblad images in Hasselblad's own focus software. So before I zoom in and start looking at resolution and detail, I'm just going to leave the shots wide for a minute. These are unedited. Um, they're just the basic raw conversions that both these software packages have done. So looking at them from this angle, you can see with the Fuji, if you look at the skin tones, they're slightly warmer, almost like there's a hint of magenta cast in there. Uh, so Fuji does lean towards warmer hues, whereas with the Hasselblad, 
Um, it could be argued they're a little bit more natural. Side by side, the skin tones on the Hasselblad look maybe a trifle yellow in comparison, but the Hasselblad is definitely a more natural look. Um, I personally like the slightly warmer look of the Fuji. You might prefer the more natural look of the Hasselblad. Um, with me with these Hasselblad files, I would be dragging that hue a little bit away from the yellow and warming it up a trifle. Um, but maybe with a Fuji, you could um, also do the reverse. You could pull out a little bit of that red and uh, and make it look a little a little bit more natural. Uh, but with RAW, you can do this. I could basically uh, tweak the Fuji file to get it to look kind of like the Hasselblad one and vice versa. Um, so that's the difference there. Now, if I zoom in a little bit here on both these shots, let's just uh, get in a little bit closer, see where we are here. Um, at this range, once the computer catches up and renders out on the right, there we are. Um, there doesn't seem to be any discernible difference. If you look at the um, eyelashes and the eyebrow here in both eyes, the details are about the same. Uh, the little skin blemishes here and, you know, little marks here. Um, they're both kind of quite equal zoomed in at this percentage, which is 50%. Now, if I zoom in a lot more, let me sort of get these both similar here. Oops, where are we? Um, bearing in mind, there's going to be a little bit of difference in uh, size here because of the resolution difference. The Fuji on the right is 102 megapixels compared to 50 megapixels from the Hasselblad on the left, even though the sensors are both the same physical size. So if I zoom right in as far as I can go on these, uh, maybe pull ahead a little bit on the Fuji there. Um, let's have a look at these eyelashes. Now, on the Fuji on the right, if you look at this long eyelash up here and compare it to the one on the Hasselblad on the left here. On the Hasselblad it's a little bit softer and you probably won't be able to see this on YouTube after the compression and depending on how large a screen you're viewing it on but I can see stepping little stepping ladders coming up the edge of this eyebrow here. I can almost count them going up there uh, with the Fuji. Um, on the right yes I've still got the steps there but they're smaller and finer and um, that's to be expected because it's 102 megapixels instead of 100. So smaller steps is better because it basically means it's going to yield a sharper image. So you can see there that that's the kind of extra resolution that we get with the Fuji. Now, if I actually count these, we've got like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. We've got 20 steps, um, almost JPEG jaggers, you could call them. We've got 20 steps going up that eyelash there on the Hasselblad. And on the Fuji here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, maybe 28 steps on the Fuji. So that isn't double the resolution. We haven't got twice as much detail and sharpness um, in the Fuji over the Hasselblad. Um, it's probably about a 20% improvement there in detail and sharpness. So not as much as you might think, um, but it is there definitely. Let me just zoom out again on both of these. So that's the first shot. Now let me go and find a non-person image here. Um, I, again, I took both these images side by side when I went out with both of these cameras. So again, on the right here, we've got the, uh, the Fuji shot and on the left, the Hasselblad. Um, again, from this distance, they both look superb. If I zoom in a little bit to about there, let me um, get the focus to do the same thing. Oops. Here we are. What I'm going to do first, I'm just going to zoom in on this sign here. Um, let me get that zoomed in. Here we are. There we go. Um, now, when I'm zoomed in this far to 400%, so you got to remember I'm zoomed in a hell of a long way here. Uh, you would normally never do this, but this is, you know, what they call pixel peeping now. Uh, with the Hasselblad on the left, you can see that it's really hard um, to read the writing. In fact, I can't really make out what any of these words say. On the right hand side with the Fuji, with that extra bit of resolution, I can read a few words here at the top of the, um, of the, I've got a few words here, the, there I can read, um, of it, you know, so I can make out some of the, the words here, uh, whereas on the Hasselblad I can't make out any of them. And also on the Hasselblad we have got this sort of uh, fringing, we've got some sort of purple and, and blues and different colours of fringing starting to coming onto the image here but again that's zoomed in at look we're on 400% here 
But again, you've got to zoom in a long way to see this at regular gallery viewing distances. If you were to print out images from either of these cameras um, to um, a, a nice big poster size on a quality fiber based print um, of maybe, you know, three by two foot or even larger and view it at a gallery distance hanging on a wall, you're not really going to see anything. It's going to be very difficult. Both of these cameras are going to produce stunning images with regard to resolution. Okay, now for the final image. Uh, this one was a shot that I took for somebody that wanted a, a typical kind of um, friendly corporate headshot for her website. Um, now again, this is where that colour science comes into play. On the right-hand side, we can see the Fuji is definitely leaning towards warmer hues. We've got this warmer skin tone, almost magenta-ish, uh, whereas the Hasselblad on the left, side by side, it looks a little bit yellow. Um, if you were to look at the Hasselblad on its own, you probably wouldn't notice that. That would look more natural, but... When you look at it side by side with a Fuji, this is warmer and this is more sort of um, yellowish in hues. Uh, for me, if I was editing the Hasselblad, again, I would basically pull away from that yellow a little bit and pull it towards the warmer hues. Fuji, for me here, is a little bit overcooked. Um, I would pull some of that redness out of the skin and pull it towards a more natural look like the Hasselblad on the left. So you can hear, see here side by side the difference in colour science. Now, if I... Uh, zoom in a bit here let's just give a couple of um, zoom ins here we go um, again from this kind of distance you can't really see any difference in resolution uh, you can see these fine hairs down here dangling off the edge of the lip um, um, on the cheek fine hairs what i like to call peach hair that um, some ladies have uh, if i zoom in even more let's give a couple more clicks in here um, here we are again if we look on the lip these little fine hairs down here on the edge you can see them both perfectly uh, similar on both of them uh, this shot was taken in an indoor environment with um, a key light a fill light and a back hair light with my bowens 500 mono blocks and uh, soft boxes and bounce umbrellas and stuff so the lighting was more consistent here as opposed to outdoors where even though the the shot of the windmill earlier I did take them literally within about 10 seconds of each other. There's always going to be a bit of light shift with clouds and stuff. But here, um, it's probably a bit more accurate and easier to tell the difference. Um, again, if you look on the nose here, we have this tiny little speck of black. I don't know what that is. It's, but again, we can see it quite easily on the Hasselblad. You might not be able to see it on, uh, on this video on YouTube. Um, what else? If I just so zoom in a little bit more to the eye here. Let's have a look. At this distance, again, you can't really see much detail maybe a trifle more um, detail in the eyelashes here on the fuji on the right now if i zoom right in a bit more here let's see how far in we can get on the house of blood um, again if we look at this eyelash here that's sort of coming down here this one here compared to the same eyelash on the fuji on the right on the house blood again we can see those steps there um, so there's probably going to be about 25 or so steps there in comparison to maybe about 30 on the Fuji. So again, it's kind of a, a kind of a 15, maybe 20% increase at the most in perceived resolution and detail that you can actually see. Forget about what the specs say on paper. I'm talking about what you can actually see. So for me, the perceived added resolution and detail of the Fuji isn't double, even though it's 102 megapixels as opposed to 50. It seems to me it's maybe 15, 20% improvement looking at the eyelashes here and the little sort of um, blood uh, blood vein type things, whatever you call them, in the eyeball here. They're not too dissimilar. The Fuji just edges it slightly, um, certainly in this shot anyway. Um, let, me, let me just sort of get those out to a more reasonable viewing distance. So um, there we go. That's about it. Um, in my opinion, there's there's not an awful lot. The color science is slightly different. The Fuji gives slightly warmer hues, whereas the Hasselblad gives more sort of slightly more natural um, hues in the color. Um, in terms of detail, the Fuji does edge it maybe by 15 or 20 percent, but it's quite small. And you really only see that if you zoom in at like 400 percent and pixel peep. Again, if you have massive posters blown out on a decent grade fiber based paper or something, and stand back and view it from like eight foot as you would maybe a four foot print on a gallery wall you won't see that resolution it's just um in my opinion it's too small to really notice you only notice it on pixel peeping um, it is there so uh, fine art photographers uh, will probably appreciate that little extra bit so there it is there's the side by side comparison 
you can make up your own minds on that one. Now I'm going to give you my thoughts and feelings on usability and build quality. I took both these cameras out together several times during the two weeks that I've had them, so I've had a lot of hands-on experience with both cameras at the same time during these shoots. During all my side-by-side -side shooting, I found the Fuji to be a beast of a camera to use and handle. It feels like it's about 30% bulkier and twice the weight compared to the Hasselblad, which actually it is. The Fuji body alone with no batteries, accessories and not even any cards comes in at 1,155 grams compared to the Hasselblad that's just 650 grams. The Fuji measures in at 16.5 centimeters in height compared to 9.5 centimeters of the Hasselblad and the Fuji is 15.5 wide compared to 14 of the Hasselblad while the narrower section of the Fuji is 5.5 centimeters thick while the Hasselblad is 3.4. So you get the picture. The Fuji is a beast of a camera that's hardly easy on the wrist for long periods of handheld work. In comparison, the Hasselblad handles and feels more like a regular full frame mirrorless camera or perhaps a mirrorless camera with a battery grip attached. In fact, after using my Sony a7 III with a battery grip, switching over to the Hasselblad was kind of seamless. Sure, the Hasselblad does feel heavier than my Sony, but it's a medium format camera and the lenses are larger, hence there's more glass and metal and weight to them. But it seems like a small step up in size, whereas the Fuji is a much larger step up in size and weight. Okay, so what about the build quality? For me, the Hasselblad wins on this front. It's milled out of a solid piece of alloy and it has the build quality and precision of a piece of military equipment. The same goes for the Hasselblad lenses. They're position made to within an inch of their lives out of high quality metals and other materials and they feel like they'll last a lifetime. Hasselblad have always made extremely high quality cameras. They're all about quality materials, precision and fastidious attention to detail and that's still the case today with the X1D2. Now the Fuji isn't bad when it comes to build quality but the materials don't feel quite as premium as one would expect from a camera costing nearly £10,000. Somehow it doesn't feel quite as tough or well engineered as a Hasselblad. If pushed, I'd almost say that my Sony a7 III feels a trifle more premium than the Fuji. And my Sony is made in China, while the Fuji is made in Japan. On the Fuji sample that I had, paint is wearing away in places and it's starting to look a trifle tired around the edges. Given that the Fuji cost a tad under £10,000, I'd expect, at this money, for me at least, for it to be a feat of engineering excellence. But it isn't. If the GFX100 cost £6,000, I'd be more inclined to say fair enough, but at 10k, for me at least, it doesn't quite hit the mark in the build quality department. The Hasselblad is half the price and it feels more solid and more premium when you try them out side by side. You can feel the difference. When it comes to the overall design of these cameras, the Hasselblad is the sleekest, most stylish camera I've ever used. It's minimal with its buttons and dials. That's not to say that you have to constantly dig into the menus. Strangely enough, you don't. Everything you need is right there on the top plate and on the back. And even when you do have to dip into the menu, it's the simplest, most logical menu you'll ever use. It's just not like the endless menu systems that you find on Nikon, Canon and Sony full frame cameras. Hasselblad chose to put in what you need and leave out what you don't. There's simply no gimmicks or unnecessary bells and whistles with the X1D2. I know I'm probably starting to sound like a Hasselblad fanboy right now. However, I do have some gripes with the X1D2. The first is, I wish you could get a battery grip for it. Not that I would need the extra shooting time because I didn't have a problem with this. But my pinky finger doesn't sit around the front of the grip. Instead, it just dangles under the camera, not really gripping anything at all. This is why I bought a battery grip for my Sony a7 III. So my pinky finger sits nicely around the front of the grip, along with my other fingers, meaning that I can get a better grip on the camera. The Hasselblad is a little larger and heavier than your average full frame mirrorless camera and I feel that I need to be able to get more purchase on the X1D's body. With my pinky finger sitting under the camera, I'm only really gripping the camera with three fingers and my thumb instead of four fingers and my thumb, which will make dropping the camera potentially easier. Something I definitely wouldn't want to do with a camera lens combo such as this, costing around £7,900. Another gripe that I have with the Hasselblad is the top dial, which you push to get it to pop up and then push again to hide it away, which is fair enough. The issue that I have with this dial is that it's made of plastic. Now, although that alone isn't a major problem, what is, is the fact that the dial does not pop up enough, and even worse, somebody on the Hasselblad design team thought it would be a good idea to taper it in towards the top, so it's wider at the bottom and tapers into a narrower circumference at the top. 
Now this type of design, coupled with the fact that the dial does not pop up enough, means it's harder to grip the dial when turning it. I can see why they designed it this way, they probably thought it would make it more stylish, but I think it would have been more stylish to just leave the edges of the dial perfectly vertical. That way there would be a nice edge to grip between the thumb and finger, and it would also sit more flush with the top plate, with no gap for dust to fall down. In use, I found the Hasselblad to be really good, well, except for the top dial of course. Whenever I pushed it down to get it to pop up, I felt like somebody had yanked me out of a Rolls Royce and plunked me into a Ford Fiesta, briefly at least, while I adjusted the dial. This could be seen as nitpicking, but for me it just triggers an itch on my brain that I can't scratch every time I have to change a setting via the poorly designed plastic dial. Another annoyance with the Hasselblad is its lack of IAF detect, which means I'm constantly moving the little focus spots around the screen to try and get it to sit directly over the subject's eye nearest the camera, and this is easier said than done. There doesn't appear to be anywhere near enough focus points on the invisible grid, so as I move the little square focusing bots around the screen, it jumps away from where you actually want it, and it snaps to the nearest point. In practice, I found that when I'd composed a nice head and shoulders portrait to perfection, I could not move the little square over either of the eyes with any precision, not even close. It would simply jump off where I actually wanted it to land, and it would end up on the forehead, cheek, or nose instead. I had to then recompose slightly, ruining my perfect composition to get the box to sit directly over the eye to guarantee focus. So it was a choice of a shot that had tack sharp eyes in focus but poorly composed, or a well composed shot with the forehead or cheekbone in focus, and the eyes being a trifle soft. For me, both these options are no good and during my shooting with the Hasselblad, I had about a 50% hit rate and a lot of wasted shots. The Fuji, on the other hand, does have IAF detect and it works really well. This was one of the pleasures of using the Fuji during the portrait sessions that I did with the camera. I didn't have to worry about focusing on the subject's eyes at all, as the IAF detect found the eyes immediately and with speed and precision, leaving me to concentrate on composition and giving the model instruction. Nice! IAF Detect has been around for years now, long before the first X1D model, which came out in 2016, so I don't quite understand why this later X1D2, which came out in 2019, doesn't have any sort of IAF Detect at all. I mean, Sony have had an IAF Detect system since about 2013, and these days everybody expects, wants, and needs IAF Detect. About half the photography I do is portraiture, so I'd find it next door to impossible to live with a camera that doesn't have this feature. While I'm on the subject of focusing, the system on the Hasselblad X1D2 is slow and laboured at best, and I found that it hunts around quite a bit, but not within a small focusing range, instead it motors from one end of the focus plane of the lens to the other, and it takes an age to do this. Hasselblad need to fix this and add IAF detect and speed up the horrendously slow focusing system, because for now at least, it seriously limits what the camera can be used for. I guess if you're a landscape photographer or studio product based photographer, this won't bother you too much, but for anything else, it's a big problem. Okay, onto the Fuji. I found the overall handling of the GFS100 to be a little cumbersome due to its bulk and weight. The Fuji doesn't have the annoying dial of the Hasselblad, but that's only because there's no dial at all. Instead, Fuji have gone with a couple of buttons and a rather unintuitive top display. Even after two weeks of use, I found the system to be confusing when it comes to moving from aperture priority to manual, and even more so for changing the shutter speeds. I was constantly, inadvertently, changing the ISO down, thinking that I was changing the shutter speed. The two buttons and the screen are something of a complicated three-card trick. I'm sure if you bought a GFS100, you'd eventually become accustomed to how the system works, but in the short term, I found it to be confusing. Admittedly, I'm not one for instruction manuals, I just prefer to dig in and find things out for myself and the method to change from manual to aperture priority and changing shutter speeds was not an easy thing to figure out. It involved a bit of trial and error. The GFX100 does come with a manual and I believe it will require some study to figure out some of the less obvious things. The GFX100 is not as sleek and minimalistic in design and layout compared to the Hasselblad and some of the buttons aren't even marked so you don't know what they do. The two top buttons next to the screen are not marked, making that whole top screen system even more complicated, and four of the buttons on the grip are not marked either, leaving one a little bewildered as to what they actually do. 
The DFS100 is definitely a camera that has to be studied and learned before it can be used in a way that resembles second nature. However, most of us only allocate the custom buttons any given features once and then leave them be. Although the GFX100 has a built-in grip and my fingers gripped it nicely around the front, I found the camera to be a little too heavy for me to comfortably walk along with it by my side in my hand. I feared, due to its bulk and weight, that there would be a danger of dropping it, so I went with the safer option of using the strap and hanging it around my neck or slung over my shoulder instead. I found shooting with the Fuji held in portrait position while using the grip's alternative shutter button to be a bit of a struggle for anything longer than a few minutes. Longer sessions required short breaks every now and then. If you plan on buying a GFX100, I'd take the opportunity to invest in a decent monopod at the same time to help out during the longer sessions of handheld work. This will also help stability, though the Fuji, unlike the Hasselblad, does have a superb in-body stabilization system of 5.5 stops, which helps enormously with handheld shooting. This IBS can be turned off or set to always or only when shooting. Naturally, you'd turn it off for tripod work. Regarding the focusing speed and accuracy, the GFX100 wins by a country mile. The Hasselblad, in comparison, is pedestrian with its focusing speed and it does have a regular habit of hunting around, often shifting from one end of the lens's focusing extreme to the other a few times before eventually hitting the mark. The Fuji is zippy and its focusing speed is reminiscent of what I'm used to with modern full-frame mirrorless cameras. The Fuji doesn't hunt around either, it just snaps into focus and stays there. Couple this with the superb IAF Detect, the GFX is a hands-down winner in both these departments. So a quick summing up of some of the feature differences. The Fuji has in-body stabilisation and IAF Detect, while the Hasselblad has neither of these. I consider both these features to be essential for today's photographers. With no IBS, you even need to have a really steady hand, a faster shutter speed or a tripod. Fuji's IBS means it's easier to handhold the camera and not get a camera shake in every other shot when shooting at slower shutter speeds. Regarding IAF Detect, I found that with the Fuji, about 95% of my portraits hit eye focus to perfection, while with the Hasselblad, it was a bit more hit and miss, with only about half the shots hitting the eye. Another point worth mentioning is the file size. Just to give you a starting point, my Sony a7 III full frame 24 megapixel camera produces RAW files at, on average, about 49 megabytes. The Hasselblad, being medium format and 50 megapixels, produces files at around 108 megabytes, while Fuji's 102 megapixel GFX100 produces files at around 208 megabytes. So if you're going to go for the Fuji, there's a chance you'll need to consider upgrading your storage system to accommodate these larger files. Okay, so if I had the money, which of these two cameras would I buy? In truth, probably neither. They both produce stunning images when compared to full-frame mirrorless cameras. With the Fuji, I could definitely see the extra resolution and detail, but although the pixel count is double that of the Hasselblad, I didn't notice doubly amount of extra detail in the RAW files. I'm not quite sure how the physics of these things work, but using my eyes while zoomed in at around 400%, I'd hazard a guess that there's about an extra 20% in added resolution and detail as seen by the naked eye. So yes, the Fuji has a little more detail than the Hasselblad, but when you compare both the Fuji and Hasselblad to full frame offerings, they are both a large jump up in resolution and detail. But the jump up from the Hasselblad to the Fuji is not quite as great as the jump up from full frame to either of these medium format cameras. When it comes to the way these cameras deal with colour science, Hasselblad definitely looks more natural, while the Fuji looks warmer and richer. If you know Hasselblad, you will know that they do like to shout about their amazing colour science. I take what most manufacturers say with a pinch of salt, as they do like their buzzwords, that's for sure. But in this case, I do happen to agree with Hasselblad. I've never seen such natural renditions of any given scene. The colours and tones that I got from the Hasselblad were supernatural and realistic. The Fuji, on the other hand, brings its own colours to the party with warmer tones and richer colours. The Fuji RAW files definitely lean towards warmer hues while the Hasselblad aims for a more natural look. Side by side, you can clearly see the difference with what these two camera makers have done with their colour science. If you're a portrait photographer like me, you might prefer the warmer look of the Fuji files while landscape photographers might prefer the more natural science that the Hasselblad offers. For me, being a portrait photographer, I actually prefer the look of the Fuji files, but it's worth remembering that when dealing with RAW files, you can drop the colour temperature a trifle or adjust the hue a trifle to get the Fuji files to look the same as the Hasselblad files and vice versa. 
I don't think I could live with the sheer bulk and weight of the GFS100 given that a lot of what I do is handheld portraiture but I love the snap EAF and the IAF detect system and the in-body stabilisation, the colours and the super detailed resolution. For the Hasselblad the images did have a look that I really like. Those natural tones I can't quite explain it but there's just something about Hasselblad images that has a certain je ne sais quoi that other cameras don't have. You have to have owned and used a Hasselblad like me to get this. Back in the day I owned a Hasselblad 500cm and with those Carl Zeiss lenses there was just something special about the images. Photographers like Ansel Adams and Helmut Newton can't be wrong but I don't think I could live with the Hasselblad X1D2 due to the lack of IAF detect and no in-body stabilisation and the horrendously slow focusing. These issues need fixing and sooner rather than later. Other things to consider is that the Fuji costs £4,500 more than the Hasselblad but the Fuji lenses are a little bit cheaper in comparison but that's because they don't have a leaf shutter system built into them like the Hasselblad lenses which brings me on to another small point worth mentioning. Due to the Hasselblad lenses having leaf shutters in them you can sync your flash at any speed you like whereas with the Fuji you're stuck with 125th of a second which is quite slow. This will be a little bit limiting if you do any kind of outdoor flash photography during the day. So this is something to consider if you're looking to buy a Fuji. Of course if you don't want the bulk and weight of the GFS100 or don't want to spend nearly £10,000 on one you could also look at Fuji's later GFX100S as it doesn't have a built-in battery grip, it's smaller in size and weight and it's about £4,500 cheaper than the GFX100. For Hasselblad I still have a soft spot for them but I feel like the X1D2 is still evolving and has some way to go. It needs IAF detect, a snappier more accurate focusing system and in-body stabilisation and also a 102 megapixel option too. Hasselblad have to bring out a couple of new cameras for sure, a replacement for this current X1D250 c model with all the aforementioned features and a 102 megapixel version. So regarding Hasselblad I guess it's just a case of watch this space. So that brings me to the end of this video, I hope you could take something away from it and remember this is my personal evaluation of these cameras so depending on your style of photography and how you work you might feel differently about either of them. As usual thanks for stopping by and I hope to see you again real soon.